My name is Pastor John Raymer, the pastor of Grace Point Church. This morning, we're going to be continuing our study in the book of Romans. Romans was written by the Apostle Paul. He had been a persecutor of the church, a Pharisee. Uh, he hated Jesus and followers of him. He thought it was all fraud. And it turns out when he encountered the resurrected Jesus Christ, he realized that Jesus was the Messiah and the Son of God. And he went from being a persecutor to a proclaimer literally in one week, in one week. And he went around the whole Eastern Roman Empire proclaiming Jesus, planting churches, writing letters. And about 25 years after he started that activity, he still hadn't been to Rome. And so from Corinth in Greece, he wrote them the letter Romans, which we're going through 16 chapters, an extensive explanation of the gospel, along with some peculiarities to the Pacific situation in Rome. And we looked at that in some of the early studies. And if you miss that, you can go back to those on our website. This morning, Paul is answering a question. Doesn't God love moralists? Now, you won't see that in the text per se, but that's the question that he's addressing. It reminded me of my favorite quote by James Garfield, the 20th president of the United States. He said, the truth will set you free, but first it has to make you miserable. Now, how many of us have had that experience when we go to the doctor? We go to the doctor for a physical or a complaint, and uh, she looks at us, examines us, weighs us, takes our blood pressure, and says rather disapprovingly, your weight is too high. If you don't lose weight, you're going to have high blood pressure, diabetes, you can have a heart attack. Uh, we hear all this. Or maybe it's a behavioral change she's suggesting, like you need to stop smoking or you'll get cancer. You need to stop drinking. It's going to kill your liver. Something very serious. It's true, uh, but it makes us miserable. And we agree with her and promise that we'll do better and we leave. Uh, but it's one thing to know what to do, and it's another to actually do it, isn't it? The truth is that few of us really do change, even when we know what's true. Mayo Clinic did a study of patients who had gone to their doctors and the doctors told their patients about something like obesity or cancer, something that was very serious in their life that needed an immediate change or they would face complicated health issues or even sudden death. Did you know that only 10% of people actually took action? Like I said, it's easier to know the right thing to do than it is to do the right thing. Now this section we're in in Romans from uh, chapter 118 through 320, this is the diagnostic section, what is wrong with humanity? Because until we hear the truth of what's wrong with us, we won't know why we need to be made right. Uh, someone says you need to be saved, and we say, saved from what? Saved why? Well, that's what Romans is laying out for us. And like President Garfield said, it might make us miserable, but it is the truth that will set us free. So Paul now is turning to a group of people who we call moralists. And moralists are people, this is the second section of people. Last week he looked at a different group, and we'll go back to that in a minute. But moralists are people who look down on others in judgment because they think they're better than that group of people even though they themselves perhaps fail. They think they're better, but they look down on others. We're going to read chapter 2, 1 through 11. I'm going to read it section by section. Uh, now we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. We'll talk about that, and then we'll keep moving our way systematically through the passage. Chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who do such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, that you who judge those do such things, yet do them themselves, yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? He says, O oh man, here, and this isn't just... He's not picking on men. It's a rhetorical device to say, we would say anybody, all of y'all, whoever this is, anyone, male or female. 
This is the psychology of someone who thinks they're uh, better than others. Uh, inside, they're really convinced they are. Uh, they look at others, they're critical in their mind, uh, their judgments, and of course, people who are critical of judgments in their mind and heart, they never keep it to themselves. You always hear about it, it always overflows. Now, this person can be a Jew or a Gentile. The Gentile is the word back then for anybody who wasn't a Jew, Jew or Gentile, anyone. It can be an irreligious person or someone who considers themselves uh, religious. The Roman Stoic philosopher Seneca was very critical of the moral depravity of men in the Roman Empire, his fellow Romans. He saw them as being morally bankrupt and heartless. And last week we talked about the moral condition of the Roman Empire in the first century. It was pretty horrible. So how is this group different from what we saw last week in chapter one? Uh, chapter one, we saw those who knew that there was a God, but they denied that, they suppressed the truth that said by unrighteousness because they wanted, to, they wanted to go their own way, they wanted to do what was wrong. It started his first examples of sexual immorality because that was so rampant in the Roman Empire. Uh, men would have a wife, but they would also have a mistress and they would have sex with other men and they would have sex with teenagers and they would have sex with young boys. It was staggering. But then, as not the only sin, he went on for a whole list of sins at the end of chapter 1, which is a devastating list of the moral depravity of people then. But the truth is, it's not really much different today. It's not any different because human beings still have dark hearts when they re reject God. Now, Paul is talking to a group who looks down on what we looked at last week. This is the group who says, yes, those people, they're awful. I thank God I'm not like them. I thank my lucky stars I'm not them. I am better uh, than they are. Uh, they condemn others while they do the same thing. You may not have noticed as I read through it, uh, I did stumble in there a little, sorry, but he says, you practice the same thing. You do the same thing. He says it actually four times in those verses. He accuses the moralist of doing the very thing they're condemning in other people. I actually don't know any place in scripture where the same statement about someone or something is made four times in a row. Usually two is enough for an emphasis and three is considered the superlative uh, in ancient literature. To have it four times in a row was a hammering indictment of the moralists. He's asking them a very damning question. Do you think you'll escape the judgment of God because you think you're better, but you're doing the same thing? Now, by same thing, that's a rhetorical device because the moralists did live better lives so he doesn't mean they're doing the exact same thing, but what he means is that they were also breaking God's law. They also were living lives that was an offense uh, to God's uh, clear standards. You don't have to be engaged in a specific action to be guilty of something, according to God. Uh, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, you don't just have to physically commit adultery to, to be adulterous, if you look at a woman with lust in your hearts, you're an adulterer. You hate a person. Uh, you don't have to murder them with a knife, but you can kill them with words. And so we have this strange human tendency that Paul is pointing out, that we tend to be critical, moralists, and we often fall in this camp, Moralists tend to be critical of others while letting ourselves off the hook. Everyone else is behaving badly, but we're okay. Perhaps my favorite American fiction writer, 
was a woman named Flannery O'Connor who lived in the South. Uh, she had lupus. Uh, she died at an early age. And in my opinion, just my opinion, the greatest American short story fiction writer of all time. Her short story, Revelation, about a woman named Ruby Turpin is probably my favorite short story uh, by any author. Ruby is, uh, all, all her stories, by the way, are set in the South. She's from the South, set in the South. Ruby is in the doctor's waiting room uh, with her husband. And most of the story takes place just in that waiting room, in her mind and in actions that take place with others. And it reveals Ruby as a narrow-minded, judgmental person. And then in a shocking way in the waiting room, in a very unexpected way, which is typical of Flannery O'Connor, she gets you coming out of left field, Ruby is confronted uh, with her narrowness and judgmentalism. And then she becomes very angry with God. And then the end of the story, well, I, I can't tell you because you need to read it for yourself. The conclusion of it, I, I can't read that story without tears filling my eyes because I'm so moved by it. So look up Flannery O'Connor. Uh, get her short stories and read her. And what Flannery points out and what the scriptures are pointing out to us right here is that we really need to be honest. Let, let's be honest, just you and I. How many of us are really harsh in our judgment of others, but we're lenient towards ourselves in the very same area? We get all self-righteous about another person's awful attitudes or actions well, we do the same thing, it's no biggie. We're human. We let ourselves off the hook. We sort of gain a perverse sense of satisfaction of thinking poorly about others so that we raise ourselves up. Others are liars, but we just rearrange the truth for our benefit. Others steal, uh, but we borrow from friends and we forget to pay back or return the object. Others are prejudiced bigots, but we have convictions. Sound a little familiar? I think we all fall in this boat more often than we know, care to admit. Now, Sigmund Freud called it projection, but he was 19 centuries late. Paul already laid it out here uh, by the Holy Spirit. This human tendency to look down on others and feel good about it and raise ourselves up, well, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice wouldn't exist as a novel if this tendency wasn't there in the human race. So Paul continues on, and he nails us with two truths here in these two verses. Number one, the moralists are right. They are right. Evil is evil. Uh, they're not wrong on that. God's standards are God's standards. But he says moralists are terribly mistaken if they think that their disapproval of others is what makes them right with God. And that's the terrible trap that moralists fall in. By grading everyone else below them or thinking God grades on a curve and they're on that upper end, they think therefore they're okay uh, with God. Friend, I have to ask you, do you, do you think you're safe with God? because you're just generally better than everyone else around you? It's a hard question, isn't it? But how many of us have succumbed to that? I don't know how many times when I've talked to people about the need for faith in Christ, uh, it's pretty much the argument I hear. Well, I'm, I'm a good person. I'm okay with God. Me and God, we're buddies, we're okay. And I ask them, by what standard do they know they're okay? Well, you know, I'm not a murderer. I'm not Paul Pod. I'm not Hitler. I'm not this person. And then they usually name someone from the political party opposite of them they hate. I'm not a drug dealer. I'm not a child molester. They have a list of all the other things that are morally wrong, but think that that makes them right with God. But friends, Paul blew that out of the argument in these first, uh, out of the water in these first three uh, verses. You see, there is a terrible danger to being a moralist. Let's continue on in verses 4 and 5. 
Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Now, in those two verses, there is a question, a warning, an invitation, and a result. Uh, they're tight, and this is a hard hammer because the self-protective skin, the armor of the moralist, has to be shattered so that they can be convinced that they need a savior. Paul brings it to a, a fine point to the moralist with a question, a rhetorical question. Do you suppose you will escape the judgment of God? Well, they think the answer is yes, but Paul has already made clear, uh, no, you don't. Now, the only way you can escape the judgment of God is to find an exception to God's rule of justice in judgment. And there is a get out of free, get out of jail free card in the Bible, but it's called the gospel. It's nothing we earn, it's what we receive. So Paul is mainly, when he talked in the first century, speaking to religious Jews who very decidedly looked down on the Gentile world, or those who were called God seekers, who were Gentiles, who were halfway converted to Judaism. They could be in worship, but they were never fully in, but they also tended to look down on others. The Jews thought that by being a Jew alone, they were part of God's covenant people, true, and therefore they were in with God, not true. Uh, Jesus made that very clear. He challenged the presumption of the Jews of his day who thought, just because they're children of Abraham, uh, they're right with God. And it's not something he invented. It's all throughout the Old Testament where the prophets were constantly challenging the Jewish people to have their hearts right with God. See, there are many people today that are functional moralists with respect to God. In this sense, they think, well, I'm a good person because I was baptized as a baby, so I'm going to go to heaven. I go to church once in a while, so I'm going to go to heaven. I occasionally put in some money uh, for those in need, so I'm going to go to heaven. I'm okay with God. I live a respectable life. I pay my taxes. I don't cheat on my husband. I'm okay. I'm okay with God because I'm a good person. But the answer to whether you can escape judgment because you're a good person is decidedly no. Because Paul has already exposed here, and he's going to continue in chapter 2, to expose we don't even live up to our own standards. The moralist doesn't even live up to their own standards, much less God's. So it is a terrible warning, he goes on to tell us here, to confuse the patience of God with God's approval. The thinking uh, goes something like this. You, you do things wrong, you continue to do things wrong, and you think, you know what? No lightning bolts come out of the sky and struck me. God hasn't struck me down with cancer. God hasn't taken my money, my health away. I have a good life. Things are going my way, uh, maybe even better than most. So I must be okay with God. Everything must be fine because God hasn't dropped the hammer on my choices that offend him. But he warns us with a triple warning here. He says, don't presume on the kindness, forbearance, and patience of God. The kindness, the forbearance, and the patience of God. Just because consequences don't come immediately doesn't mean they won't eventually be coming. So why is that? Why is that? Well, that's the invitation. He says here, because God is giving you time to repent. Time to repent. You see, God is not indifferent, and God is not careless towards us. That is, he doesn't care. He cares about us deeply. But he cares that we do things the right way, his way, and we need to repent. To repent 
means to turn, literally means to turn, to change the mind, but it's referring to a way of life, turning from us being in charge to God being in charge. He's giving us time because he's patient. We already learned in chapter 118 that God is wrath, his coming, he is angry at sin, but we saw that he's being patient in that it's not landing on us quickly. It's being stored up, but it does tend to show up in our lives because when we live lives that are not according to what he says in the scriptures, it tends to reap a bitter harvest in our life. And then we think maybe when it doesn't come that God is indifferent and he doesn't care. No, Paul says both are true. God is angry with our sin, but God is also patient with our sin. He loves you so much and he wants you to repent because he wants you to be his child and be with him forever. So while we have a hard time with that with human beings, we think someone's either being loving towards us or angry towards us. God, someone is even being patient or indifferent. In fact, scripture says that God loves us and he is angry at what we do wrong. He is wrathful and patient and kind. He's never indifferent. He's giving us time to repent. And what's the result of our impenitence, our lack of repentance? Why does that happen? Verse 5 says, because of our hard hearts. It's not because God made us that way. It's because that's what we choose to do. Because our hearts are hard, that's a biblical term for uh, opposite of, of course, soft. A soft heart is a heart that's responsive to God. A hard heart is an indifferent heart to God. And because our hearts are unrepentant and indifferent, we're storing up, verse 5 says, wrath for ourselves. The wrath doesn't come immediately, but it is being stored up. There is a day of wrath coming. What is that day that's coming? That's the day of judgment at the end of the world. This is scripture say, everyone who's ever lived will be resurrected and stand before God and we will give an account of our lives. And there's two ways that can go. You can try to explain everything you've done and why you should be okay with God and it isn't gonna work. Or you can say, I have no excuse, but I have an advocate here, Jesus Christ. He lived the life I couldn't live. He died the death I deserved so that I can receive the eternal life that I did not earn. So there's a warning here. But again, don't think God's lack of consequences is his indifference. He's being kind, giving you time to change the way you're living. So that brings us to the logical question out of that is this day of wrath, when is it coming and, and who gets what from God on judgment day? Now I'm gonna get a little technical here for you. Uh, those who attend my church know that I teach the scriptures to life because the most important thing I can do is explain what the Bible says so that we can understand it and apply it because faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word. Uh, Jesus said it is the truth that will set us free. So explaining the scriptures is my top priority as a pastor. And sometimes you have to dig out the bones a little bit. Sometimes I teach also to explain how I got to where I explain things, kind of go behind, give the research. And I'm gonna read here verses six through 11 in a moment, uh, but I want you to see here that there is a very definitive structure to six through 11. When we uh, write things in the Western world, uh, we go A, B, C, conclusion. The Jewish way, when something was really important, uh, they did it in a very different way. They would go idea, second idea, third idea, third idea repeated in a different way, go back to the second idea and go back to the first. Uh, you'll see the way I've organized it here. It looks like the side of the letter X, chi in Greek, and that's why this is called a chiastic structure from the letter chi. Now, you don't have to remember any of that, but just remember as I read through, why does it seem like he jumped from one topic, goes back, and then at the end goes back to the beginning? It's not out of order. It's not confused. It's a very tight, specific way of writing that is very Jewish. You find it throughout the Old Testament and in certain places in the New Testament. 
And what that did to the reader of the day went, wow, this is all tied together and all these points within this group all relate together to one idea. So let's read six through 11. He will render to each one according to his works, to those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. He will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. For there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also to the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no impartiality. Now, 6 through 11, 6 and 11, if you noticed, it has the same idea. And that idea is that God gives justly to each as they deserve. He uses different words. He will render to each according to his works, verse 6, and then in verse 11, for he shows no partiality. And those two are Statements are slightly different ways of saying the same thing that God gives justly to each as they deserve. We need to uh, understand uh, that God is a judge who hands justice out perfectly. Thank God that God is not capricious. Thank God that God is just. Uh, we have some good and some not so good judges in the human race. And doesn't it make you angry when a judge is unjust or unfair or doesn't take all the evidence into account and renders an imperfect verdict? On a human level, we certainly want just verdicts. And we're assured here from the scriptures that God is just. Uh, verse 6 is actually a quotation from Psalm 62. Jesus taught the same principle that principle of perfect justice, it's throughout the Old and New Testament. A way to say it negatively is God doesn't have class favorites. He's not like a, a bad parent who has five kids and clearly favors one over the other. Everyone gets the same treatment with God because that idea that God played favorites was very present in the Jews' mind. They thought because they were Jews, they were favored. But he uses that same phrase first to the Jew and then to the Gentile twice in what I just read to say, no, everybody, it's all the same. God is just. God gives to everyone what they deserve. Now, the next group of ideas are found in, group, in verse 7 and verse 10. And those together say this, that those who seek God are given eternal life. Now, you might say... <clears throat> Now, wait a minute, John, verse 11 says well-doing, and verse 10 says everyone who does good. That's correct. It does say that. And at first blush, that may seem that you get eternal life by earning it, by what you do, by works. But the Bible is crystal clear, and we'll see it as we go through Romans. Crystal clear. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, not by what we do couple chapters ahead, Romans 3, 28. For we hold that one is justified by faith, that means right with God, apart from works of the law. See, the key modifier is found in verse 7. It says, for those who by patience in well-doing seek. Paul is saying there is a persistent direction to the person's life who receives eternal life. And what is that? Well, look at the words that qualify the phrase seeking. In verse 7 and in verse 10, he uses the word glory. In verse 10, 7 and 10, he uses the words honor. In verse 7, he says immortality. And in verse 10, peace. So six words, two groups, and then the last group, slightly different. All those words to a hearer in Paul's day and to a Jew who knew the scriptures would immediately associate those words with God. It was Paul's way of saying those who will receive eternal life are those who seek God. Those who seek God are given eternal life. We don't have glory. Glory is the manifestation of God himself. Honor comes from 
the approval and blessing of God. Immortality, verse 7, is a quality of God that we don't have until we're given eternal life. And peace uh, really is referring back to the Hebrew word shalom. Shalom, which means uh, not simply absence of conflict, it means much more positively the wholeness of life. Everything is right, right with God, right with one another. It's the way the world was before sin came into the world, and it's the way the world is at, going to be when it's remade and Jesus reigns on earth. So all of those qualities are saying those who believe in the gospel, who seek God, will receive that. So instead of peace, peace, uh, instead of wrath, wrath is removed. Instead of judgment, uh, eternal life. Because the greatest good that we can seek in life is God himself. So this is the life direction, seeking, patiently seeking what is good is seeking God. When you remember back from chapter 1, verse 5, that pithy statement, the obedience of faith, you remember that? I said we'd unpack that as we go. Well, here's an example of it being unpacked. Obedience meaning a direction, faith that is in God. Our obedience is our faith in God. And eternal life, he says right here, not earned, he uses the word, verse 7, give. It's given. It is a gift from God. The Bible is clear, as I said earlier, only Jesus was obedient to the Father's will. He lived the life we never lived. Death comes because of our sin, and he died the death we deserve on the cross. He had the immortality to rise from the dead in victory. It's all about Jesus Christ. So, seeking, does that mean that the believer uh, in Jesus uh, lives a perfect life? that he's always good, always done the right thing. Uh, the Bible is very clear that that is not true. The book of James says we all stumble in various ways. Perfection only happens when we see Jesus at the end of the world and we're transformed into the new heaven and new earth. But until then, there is a projection of our life that when someone is a Christ follower over time, they should increasingly look like Jesus Christ. Just like when babies are born in a family, they look like babies and everyone goes, who do they look like? Mother and father. Oh, they look like a little tomato with eyes. That's what they look like. But over time, right, as children develop, they look more and more often like one or the other parent. Uh, I have a, a son who looks just like my great-grandfather, his great-great-grandfather. If you held their pictures up next to each other, you'd think it was the same person because there's a genetic code in him to become like the family likeness. So when we are given the grace of God, it transforms our life. To say it oppositely, there's uh, absolutely no biblical evidence that's saying, I believe in Jesus, but having no life change, uh, that will not get you where you need to be. Your security is not that your parents had you baptized as a baby. There's no security in that at all. It's only through the gift of eternal life for those who are seeking God. Let's say it agriculturally. If a fruit tree is alive, it will produce fruit. If the fruit tree is dead, there is no fruit. Jesus used that very image. So lastly, we look at the interior verses eight and nine judgment in wrath and fury comes upon self-seekers instead of those seeking good that is seeking god it says remember i said there's two directions towards god away from god repenting is turning from away to god well this says the self-seekers that is who are running hard the opposite direction they display a triple bitter fruit paul uses three phase phrases they don't obey the truth, they obey unrighteousness, and they do what is evil. The exact opposite of a God seeker. See, there aren't two kinds of people in life, there aren't three kinds of people, four or five, there are only two kinds of people according to the scriptures. Those who are seeking God and those who are not. 
And by seeking, I don't mean half-hearted. I mean seeking him as the scriptures tell us to, to find Jesus Christ. Another way of saying is this. We're either our own king or God is king. We're either submitted to God or we want the world to submit to us. It is either, Lord, your will be done, or we say, my will be done. The self-seekers will experience the wrath of God, a terrible judgment of hell. There is justice. But the God-seekers find the gift of eternal life. It is given to them. It's not earned, it's a gift. It is through faith in what Jesus has done for us. Let's consider here at the end the very words of Jesus. He said in chapter 5, 24 of the Gospel of John, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. You want to know how to skip the last judgment, where you will be perfectly judged for everything you've said and done, and you don't stand a chance? It is through faith in Jesus Christ. Not mere mental assent. It is bowing to him. As it says in Romans 10, you confess Jesus as Lord. He's the boss. You are not. A little later in John 6, chapter 40, he says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him. Looks on is a repetition. Looks on, believes. It's the same thing. Our focus is on him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. That means you can be assured that when you die, and we all will die, friends, that if you put your trust in Jesus Christ and you believe in him, you will be raised from the dead. If your life is devoted to following Jesus Christ, to seeking him imperfectly, yes, imperfectly, yes, we all stumble, but a trajectory of faith and following, there's fruit on the tree, there's evidence that you're following Jesus Christ, you can have confidence that you'll be resurrected, that you will not be judged, but welcomed. Let's go back and remember that verse earlier in our passage. God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. So, my friends, I want to leave you with that thought. Are you presuming on God's kindness? Are you saying, you know what, later I'll get right with God. I want to live life my own way that's just going to harden your heart even more. It'll make it harder and harder to turn to him. Why not now turn your life over to Jesus Christ? Why not now repent of the rebellion of sin, which says my way and says humbly on our knees, Lord, your way. To receive forgiveness, to receive life transforming power by the Holy Spirit to have God repair perfectly the breach between us. When we believe in him, it says we are in Christ. And when we are in Christ, we have eternal life. It's given to us now. We experience the fullness of it later. Why wait? You friends do not know what tomorrow will bring. I'm telling you the truth. It may feel uncomfortable, but it's the truth. And for those of us who are believers, I want to urge you to persevere hard after God, to take stock of where you know you've been rebelling against God. I had to search my own heart this week and confess areas to God. You see, repentance isn't just the initial turning. It's a continual turning to God. Just like you don't clean your house once when you move into it and never clean it again. Well, I know some people do that, but we know, right, that's not a healthy way to live. You clean your house regularly. You take a shower every day, I hope. You brush your teeth. We clean our bodies. We clean our cars. We clean our homes because we know that's a better way to live. Well, as Christians, we need to keep cleaning up. So the word from the day is don't presume on God. Repent. For Christians... Take stock of one area you might need to clean up and confess before God and ask for his help. And for those of you who have not yet turned to Jesus Christ, I beg you, don't presume on his kindness. Instead, turn to his kindness today. Let me pray for us all. Father, we thank you for this hard truth, which makes us a little miserable, but it is the truth that sets us free. Jesus, you told us that. And you are the truth. You are the way. You are the life. 
Father, may you grant eternal life for those right now who are praying this prayer, saying, I'm wrong. God, I've been wrong. I know I've been living my own life. I've been judging others. I've been living a life where I don't care what others think. I don't care what you think. I am sorry. I want to live differently. But I can't do it by my own strength. I need you to change my heart. And I believe your promise that if I believe in Jesus Christ, I will be forgiven and resurrected on the last day. And Father, for those of us who are Christians, help us to have soft hearts before you, to keep bringing areas before you that we need to bring increasingly under your Lordship, not because you want to shame us, but because you want to grow us. You're a Father who loves us. Father God, thank you for your word, for faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word. I pray you bless everyone who's heard this word today and that they would come back again as we continue to go through Romans. Amen. Well, thanks again for joining us. I'm so glad you could be with us. Check out past sermons on our website and stick with us as we continue to go through this wonderful book. God bless.